he went ahead and fed me and he went ahead and gave me drink. I was like, can you take these ropes off? They're like, no, I got other plans for you. So then I became uh, a mobile, I became a mobile inventory for this dude. Like, like the armless zombies and walking dead. I was just like, <laughs> stay a survival podcast, bringing you survival game news. And then I was on the coast acting like a Bambi. Oh, wait a minute. Hello, folks. I was just about to talk about how I once used to bait people pretending I was a Bambi. But we're going to go ahead and get into the show. (laughs) (laughs) So welcome to the State of Survival podcast, folks. And today we're going to be talking about DayZ. And we're going to be talking about what got us into buying DayZ initially. First impressions, media, hype, whatever you want to call it. And then we're going to talk about what it was like just beginning in DayZ. Was it frustrating? Was it fun? Was it encouraging? We just got done doing a poll with over 87 votes. And most of you folks voted that it was hard, but you kept pushing through. It's not exactly what the poll said, but pretty much was the highest voted one. So let's go ahead and get to our staff introductions and see what they're up to. Yara, what's up, man? Not much. I'm almost done backing up six terabytes of data by hand. From my failed hard drive. Terabytes. Yeah. Video what? assets, graphic design assets. I mean, like some of those little video clips that I make with the intros, they come in packages that are 17 gigabytes a piece. Uh, but on Friday, I was giving a roast for our dear friend Dimension 119. And before I could even start the roast, lightning hit the um, transformer that's right outside of town hall, and we all lost power. And I didn't know this, but my UPS, my backup power supply with battery in it, wasn't charging the battery because the battery had failed. So yeah, my computer shut off and the old six terabyte solid state rest in pepperonis. I can still get it to turn on, but I can't stress it out too much or else it turns off. So whew, I am looking forward to getting back into my regular schedule of streaming. Uh, obviously today, tomorrow we won't be doing Dungeons and Dragons because I don't have any of my maps or anything. So I'll be pulling something out of my butt Thursday. Hopefully we'll be doing something fun uh, with the SOS crew. And then on Friday, it's either going to be Star Trek Resurgence or my heavily modded Fallout 4 that's got over a thousand mods Call me crazy. Uh, And then back to Fallout Aurora and uh, Space Engineers. So it's good to have a normal week again. Yeah. Also, you are crazy. And why were you roasting someone? Okay, so Dimension 119, the gentleman who played Gramps, put on a community fundraiser to help raise money to get a computer. And they did it. He, he was able to buy a gaming computer within a year of fundraising. So he said if we matched this goal within a year, he would shave his beard. So I was, because I am actually an ordained priest, I thought, well, I'll do a funeral for your beard, but let's make it a roast. So it was a roast style funeral, and it was like four pages long. It was so good. I used to do roasts at the improv club. I was really looking forward to it. Had my outfit on and everything, and then nothing. Oh, very sucks. sad. Sucks. Either way, Red, what's up with you? Oh, busy working, um, researching, looking at some new games that either just came out or just came into, hey, it's coming soon. So there's some exciting things uh, coming out in the game space. And uh, yeah, just researching and, and learning more um, about my producer job here on the show and the skills that I need to make that work. Um, yeah, so fun times. Yeah, that's awesome to hear about. That's awesome to hear about. And folks, I am boring as heck. I've been working in the background on the state of survival stuff as well, learning how to be a better owner slash host of the show itself. And we actually have a cool thing coming up within the next couple of days that I hope you folks will be happy and excited to hear and listen to. But let's go ahead and move on from me and move on to what I was just talking about just a minute ago when we started the show. Yeah, today's podcast is going to be about Daisy and what made us want to buy it, what really got us interested in Daisy, and what it was like being a Bambi, a fresh player washing up on the beach. Or if you're a pre-six player, possibly spawning in the woods a little bit off the coast. 
But overall, I kind of want to explore this subject and kind of get into why we love DayZ and what truly made us take the dive into this wonderful game. So let's go ahead and move on to uh, the first subject. So, so we're going to talk about the first impressions of DayZ. What actually made us want to buy DayZ itself? Now I'm actually going to let Yarl go for this because I don't think you actually bought DayZ from the get-go, did you? Oh yes, I did. Okay. I uh, so I was a big Arma Two player, and the team and I really got into it. I've always been a fan of tactical shooters, especially realistic tactical shooters. Arma Two just fit the scratch. And then I found a server called Altus Life with Arma 2. Got into Altus Life. I was a cannabis farmer. You know, it's a role play server. Had so much fun. Got tricked into robbing a bank and realized, oh my God, role play with this kind of thing. You don't have to be good at gunplay, which I, I am, but that doesn't have to be every time you play an Arma game. And I loved it. And then there was a hush, a murmur back in 2012 about this mod that came out of nowhere called the DayZ mod. And I was hooked ever since. I even bought a uh, standalone the moment it came out on early release. Uh, tried playing that a little bit, but I went back to the Arma 2 mod until it fleshed out. But yeah, I've, I was totally roped into DayZ just because uh, I played Altus Life and realized that the Arma 2 engine had a lot more to offer than just tactical missions every day. That's really cool. And more or less what I meant when you I said that you didn't buy it right away is that the Arma 2 mod Daisy actually is what sucked you into the kind of Daisy experience. And like you just said, you literally bought it when it first came out. What made you jump from the Arma 2 mod of Daisy to the standalone version? What was it just the community that you were a part of, or just your experiences like this standalone version is gonna be way better? Or what? So a lot of it had to do with hype. Uh for those of you who don't remember, early access to the standalone really started propagating right around 2013. I hadn't even been playing the DayZ mod for about a year and a half. And there were some things with the mod that I had some issues with, the bad driving and stuff like that. And I thought, you know, maybe there was a lot of us in the DayZ mod universe that were like a standalone. Maybe it's going to be free of the bugs that have plagued Arma 2 with this mod. Maybe they'll be able to make it from the ground up and the first thing that caught my attention was uh, Dean Hall showing what the actual Chinaris look like and them talking about having skyscrapers and other buildings, other apartment complexes, and just some of the footage that they had of what they were planning for the map based off of real world photography. And I was like, whoa, this is way more full of life than normal Daisy Arma 2 mod. I totally want to get behind this and uh, sign me up. Uh, and then my first two days into standalone, I made backpack inception, broke the server, got banned from the server and thought, well, maybe I'll just come back to this when it's fixed. <laughs> OK, OK, very interesting about that. I think what actually got me first impression wise to pull the trigger and buy Daisy was honestly, I convinced my friend to buy it for me because I, back then, was incredibly broke and buying even Daisy at that time being only a $30 game was too much money for my poor uh, broke ass. However, uh, I enjoyed it. Um, I played Daisy off and on for quite a while, honestly, and I never experienced the Arma 2 mod. I'm one of the people who... I experienced DayZ standalone as it was about, I think, when it first came out, and then I kept playing it. But I tried to go back to the Arma 2 mod because everybody said it was still better than the standalone. And unfortunately, even if it was better, its quality of life mechanics were just so worse for me that I stuck to standalone. I couldn't go back to the Arma 2 mod. Uh, and I think that's kind of more or less what really made me want to buy the game. Um, and I have actually purchased, I think, a total of 12 copies of Poppy Sense for various friends, and I have two alternate accounts. Uh, one of them was for me to be able to play on my own server, so people <laughs> didn't know about it. <laughs> but, um, no, I, I really enjoyed Daisy itself, and 
thing. Now, this is something that I usually don't do, folks, but I actually want to ask our producer, because this is all something that's important to all of us. Red, what made you want to go into DayZ? Was it the mod, or did you go standalone? No, I was, uh, I came in, um, it must have been, it was just pre-pandemic, and was on console. So I started playing on Xbox. And uh, so totally missed the, I, I was aware of Arma, but I'd never played on it before. So never really played the mod until later. Um, it was just straight into Daisy Standalone and did, I don't know, maybe six or eight months um, on Xbox and just, you know, fighting my way through trying to survive <clears throat> until I switched over to PC. And then it was a pretty quick progression into uh, uh, playing and then starting to develop mods myself and, and kind of the whole path I'm on now. Wow. That was very interesting. We all come from a different kind of aspects. I'm a Jarl's a true Arma 2 mod, uh, you know, player, got into Daisy, went to Daisy Standalone, went back. And then I'm a person who just bought it when Daisy Standalone first came out. Actually, our slight image is actually from one of my oldest Steam pictures I ever had showing my friend I got Daisy to actually boot up because that did <laughs> a lot. <laughs> but uh yeah, uh that was that was the uh, login menu back then. Let's go talk about what actual other factors truly convinced us to buy Daisy other than the hype. Um so like for me, the factors that kind of made me wanna buy Daisy was not only the hype of it, but also my friends wanted to play this so-called amazing game. Uh, and they had such fun experiences. And some of the experiences I had actually were pretty cool because one of my first experiences was somebody pouring bleach or from the disinfecting bottle down my character's throat and then them both standing around me and feeding me the food they had stole from me while, you know, unfortunately I met my demise. Um, but like, there were a lot of interesting situation <laughs> situations. I'm laughing because I, I have so many of them. But I didn't experience those until I actually bought DayZ. But I heard those stories. I got that engagement. And that made me almost kind of like what you said with Atlas Life. It kind of made me desire to make them myself, to encourage them to find them. And that's kind of what truly got me to convince my friend to buy Daisy for me. Uh, what about you, Daryl? What truly, besides the hype, helped make the decision? Um, I am, well, that's kind of hard to say because of what I was going to school for at the time. I bought every early access I could. Um, and this was back in the era where Minecraft Early Access came out in 2009 and it was a thrilling success. We hadn't really been burned out by the Early Access cons by 2013. So every Early Access title, I was like, purchase, purchase, purchase. I didn't really have a whole lot of justification for it. My friends didn't want to purchase it. They're like, no, this is fun the way it is. I, I bought it and experienced it on my own and I did not regret it. Even though I did take a step back from it because of the backpack inception, which if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, one of the things that I did was I found a uh, mountaineering backpack and then put stuff in it and a mountaineering backpack and then put that in a mountaineering backpack. And I'm like, why is this a feature? And then everything was fine until I was like, oh, I know I've got a can of food out here somewhere. And I unloaded one of the backpacks from my backpack and then the server crashed. So after I went back to it, figuring that was a bug. I'll never do that again. I wanted them to patch it a little more. I get in there and I get a burlap sack put over my head. I get tied up with rope and these guys are like, you, you're going to walk towards Zeligonorsk. And they're walking behind me and they're making me sing songs and stuff. And they're like, I want you to sing the 12 days of Christmas. And if you stop, I'm going to shoot you. And I was like, <laughs> On the 12 days of Christmas, my true love came to me. And I'm walking in a direction. And then finally, I hear this guy go, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Stop, stop, stop. I go, I was told to sing this song or else those guys will shoot me. They're like, what guys? I'm like, huh? So they took the burlap sack off my head. Those guys had me start singing and then they left. So I was walking aimlessly north through the woods with a burlap sack on over my head and ropes behind my back. And I was like, this is why I love the game. Forget the infected, forget the PvP, 
That stuff is why I love Daisy. Oh man, that is that is awesome. That is awesome. Because back then, uh, the only way you knew if you had enough food and water was if you pushed tab. And back then, you couldn't push tab when your hands were tied. Mm -hmm. You were completely, you know, didn't you couldn't do anything besides walk around. Uh, so that that's that's crazy. You probably were starving and super thirsty. I was starving. I was too. super thirsty. He went ahead and fed me and he went ahead and gave me drink. I was like, can you take these ropes off? They're like, no, I got other plans for you. So then I became uh, a mobile. I became a mobile inventory for this dude. Like like the armless zombies and walking dead. I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I didn't know oh you could God. struggle out of the ropes. I will say that I did not know you could struggle out. I thought it would immediately uh, cause deep bleed and you would die. They just punch you a couple times, stop you. Oh, it was oh, great man. fun. At one point, he was being attacked by um, a bunch of infected, and I ran out. Run away, sir! I've got this! And just jumped in front of the infected, like, oh, how about you? Tis a flesh wound! And that's how I freed myself. So, so let me let me get this straight. You're playing the game, you get tied up, burlap sack over your head, you're told to walk... No, um, whatever direction you're told to, singing a song, a guy eventually comes across you, takes the burlap sack off, uses you as a meal, and then you try to save him. I'm no psychologist. Oh, no, he, listen, I think he fed me. Syndrome. Listen, he fed me and he gave me water, okay? At that point, I had no idea what I was doing because the standalone was so much significantly different than Arma 2. So I had a free source of food, I had water, and I had Daddy who was protecting me with his big DMR. So I was cool with it. I was alive. When daddy was being attacked by the infected, I saw my whole life flash before my eyes and I had to do something. So I protected daddy. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just clearly daddy. you had very different parasocial relationships than I did. Okay. He was my burlap daddy and I lived a long time with him. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, I can't ask Red's first impression and why he eventually bought the game without talking about what other factors actually made him want to buy the game. What other factors made me want? You know what? I don't even remember. It was just looking for games to play on Xbox and just randomly going, oh, what is this? And I, I had been pretty big into first person shooters and played a lot of Battlefield. Um, and kind of followed that um, brand, but uh, so Daisy, Days, what is what is this all about? And uh, so I figured, well, might as well get it, and <clears throat> got in, started playing, and um, uh, continued to die over and over from starvation or other stupid things, and uh, till I finally got kind of that to that first. That first click where you figure out, okay, I can, I can figure out if I've got a bad spawn right away, or, uh, or I need <laughs> to, uh, you know, go. I, I'm, I'm on a good road. So. Uh, all right, folks, let's go ahead and do our hot takes. I believe up first up is red. That is correct, and. Uh, so I've got something a little bit different. I know we're talking about DayZ this week, but I've got a hot take that's completely outside the scope of DayZ and whoa, not even it's not whoa. even a survival no, no, no. Time game. Out, time out, time out, time hey, out. Hey, 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 I hey, was guys. told No, no, don't aim me. I was told when we did hot takes they should be related. Wait, who okay. told you that? I don't remember hearing that. What, Apparently dumb daddy on? lied to me. That's fine. No, I see. Oh, He's I do not want to be dumb dad. That. <laughs> All right, I don't go want ahead, it, Daddy. Okay, go okay. Ahead with what you're doing. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll I'll tie this into converse, an ongoing conversation we've had. How about that? Better. So talking yeah, about sure. procedural maps okay. and procedural map generation. So there's a new game that just came out, as you can see what here in this. <laughs> well, this what? is a graphic oh, showing I lots of screen Wait a minute. Shots. What is that? <laughs> You told me not to submit 16 photos into the podcast. That is 16, right? All you did was uh, clip them together into one photo. That's uh, okay. Let me see they if I can no do some to... magic here. Hang on. Hold your horses. Hold your horses. I'm trying to read it. Okay. Is Whoa. this better? 
that's that's a bit oh, better. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I okay. like that. Although I have that's walking nice. one. So what? So this game is called Six Days in Fallujah, and it just came out last week. <laughs> <laughs> and the big part of it, the the two big components of this game that they're very excited about, peakers, is um, the realism and the the kind of immersiveness of the game. And then the fact that the maps are procedurally generated when you go start to play. So obviously it's a, it's an early release. So they've got really two modes. One is a training mode, which these are pictures are from. And the other is um, a mission mode, but the missions are somewhat limited. So you can play with other players online in kind of a traditional first person shooter, get in the lobby and then get with a, a fire team and then go do a mission. Um, but what this picture represents is actually um, 16 different uh, training sessions that I started. And you can see the basically the training session is you go kick in the door to a, a house and uh, clear the house. So it's it's kind of that slaughterhouse um, type of approach training training scenario. So they're all targets. There's no live uh, AI inside. But you can see the variation buildings. Um, both from the outside, and you can start to see a pattern that they're kind of a variations on a theme, but some are uh, one story, some are two story, some are actually three story with a roof, um, different uh, room layouts. So the whole idea is rather than like as a DayZ player, we get really good at memorizing the building layouts. So you know when you're running through, oh, this is this is the this kind of house, this is the log cabin. I know exactly where to go for the loot point. So it's just kind of a memorization thing. Where they're trying to take this uh, in in this new game is that you have to actually learn room clearing techniques rather than just memorizing where everything's going to be. And to me, that's fascinating because that makes the game almost unlimited playability. That's actually really cool. Uh, I, I uh, know a few people who are actually in the Battle of Felucia uh, right after... Uh, they graduated and one of the things that a lot of them have been telling me is the devs are very in touch with actual veterans that served in that conflict mm -hmm. and they said that when they went into the city they were it was a labyrinth they had to go room by room but it was an absolute labyrinth because things that they were told would be there weren't there buildings that they were had described to them were not the same that they were anticipating and the crazy thing about this game is not only is, are the buildings, you know, procedurally generated, so you have to rely on your training more than anything else, but they did such a good job with the sound engineering of how the, the audio echoes down the street. You can't tell if that person's shooting at you from half a block away or, or you know, two blocks away. You have to look for those bullets and stuff, so you have to stay together. And that's so cool that you brought that up. Absolutely. That's so the, neat uh... to see that. The, the soundscape, and we'll, I actually have a gameplay example here we'll look at in just a second, but the soundscape, uh, when I was playing on a mission with some other players, um, you can talk locally just by talking, um, and if you're in within hearing distance, you can hear them, but it adds the room effects to it, too. So mm -hmm. if you're in the room, you'll hear an echo. If you go into the next room, it sounds like someone's in the next room. And then if you hit the space bar for comms, it sounds like you're talking on a radio. So you get the radio crackle and the uh, that kind of just the change in the EQ of the sound. So it's just very immersive. That's so cool. And that HDR effect of going outdoors to indoors to outdoors yep. again, it is so disorienting. They did such a good job with it. The only video game I've seen even attempt it to that degree was Assassin's Creed Odyssey if you have HDR enabled. Uh, when you go into a tomb, it's pitch black, you can't see, then your eyes adjust. And then when you step out, it's like blinding, not even fallout <laughs> was able to replicate that. Right. So let's take a look at a little bit of gameplay. I think I got like two minutes on here, but we're not going to sit through the whole thing. So this is four individual sessions. You can kind of see the difference uh, in the layout and the way things are are set up. Wow, that's crazy. And and don't don't pay any attention to my targeting speed. I am a complete potato. <laughs> okay, go. Okay. That's nuts. That is nuts. 
Yeah, so that's... Go ahead. I'm just going to take us back What's fascinating is um, it's not just the rooms are laid out differently. It's the clutter in the rooms is different. Yes. Yes. So that's that's really cool uh, because it immediately makes your eyes like have to wander around. You don't just immediately look around the room and clear it. And you're worried about what's behind the big pile of junk or debris or whatever. It looks like mm -hmm. one of them had like a half ball broken down or something. It's kind of cool. Yes. Yeah. No, that's a really, really exciting game. And it's one of those that, uh, you know, I had seen that it was coming out. The videos that I'd seen about their procedural work was what really excited me. And uh, then when it came out, uh, you know, I'm all ready to play a fully baked game. And of course, it's just got these kind of teaser elements, which are fun to play, but very excited to see what they're going to have coming out. Definitely. Yeah, that's Definitely. awesome. And it just goes to show what can be done with procedural design. And then this was all built in Unreal Engine. So it's got all of the, uh, I think they, it actually was released uh, in Unreal Engine 5 at least. So it's taking advantage of a lot of the new technologies that are available with Unreal Engine. Nice. So that's my hot take for this week. My hot take is also not DayZ related. Uh, oh, did man, it's it's a broad it's a broad spectrum. Okay, it can affect Daisy. And my take is on in-game merchants and traders. Now there was a reality show that came out called The Colony. It came out several years ago, and one of the things that they tapped in is the natural desire for trade. It will happen. You will see whether it's a guy pushing a grocery cart or somebody with a rundown truck. Someone hawking supplies for either ammunition, like in Metro, or caps, like in Fallout, or some sort of currency that is not needed to survive, but considered a luxury. And I really do think survival games need more of this, even if it's a caravan. And that is one thing I do think Fallout does well, is the trader caravans. We saw it first really shine in New Vegas and, and after that. If there is ever an NPC mod for DayZ that has traders, this is how it should be done. It should be done with armed escorts where they move from town to town and they have minor things that you might need. Ropes, you know, um, knives, axes, matches, canned food, beverages, things like that. I really think that could be strong. As for the currency, as long as it's themed and it works I think the currency system could be very well or very easily done, even if you just do a barter system. Here's how many of these items have been looted on the map. Therefore, it has this value. That might be a lot of processing power for a mod. But a lot of the training mods we see now, it's got a market. There's some people standing there. You have an ATM with artificial money. So then you go buy things for a crazy amount of money. That's how most of the trader mods work on Daisy currently. But I'd like to see a more immersive system. Where it's like, okay, bullets are worth more. So if you trade bullets, then you could potentially get a scope or binoculars or, you know, things like that. Gloves, things that you're struggling to find. Um, could you shoot the trade caravan? Absolutely. You know, but with the NPCs around it, maybe it'll be difficult. Um, maybe you won't get that much if you shoot them because they shouldn't carry everything. They shouldn't have military spec weapons. It should just be general goods and they should travel near the coast like actual merchants would. But that's my rant. I think more games should have merchants and just having a trading system does not ruin a survival game. If anything, it just psychologically makes more sense. No, that's definitely true. That is definitely true. And folks, because I am lame, I don't have a hot take. <laughs> Let's go to commercial. All right, folks, now that we are back, well, let's go ahead and talk to uh, each other about what was like, what was it like, the brand new player experience when we first logged into Daisy, our first like 10 to 15 deaths. Because let's face it, if you survived your first life and had a heck of a time, you had friends helping you, and that is a totally legitimate way to play. However, for me, that was not the case. I spawned on the beach i was trying to figure out where my friends were we're all playing the game for the first time 
they were telling me their landmarks and everything else. We're doing, you know, the logical things with, oh, I see a factory. Oh, the coast is on my right. The sun is on my right. And we were all, you know, giving each other these instructions. About, I don't know, four or five deaths in, we finally find each other. And when I say each other, I mean there's five of us and only two of us find each other. And the rest of us are still lost. So we're <laughs> still staggering around, not knowing how to do this. And it wasn't because the game was bad. It was because we were learning how to play the game. We were having laughs, belly aches. We were making fun of each other, sharing experiences, and all of those kind of situations. I remember when we figured out that we could make a fire. Actually, I, I take that back. When we found out we could take an axe to a tree and get firewood, it was like we were like celebrating like it was Cinco de Mayo. We were like, yeah, we were so happy. <laughs> um, I call because... those the Oonga Boonga moments where you're like, fire! Ah! Wilson! <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, different movie. <laughs> um, but no, that was my experience for like my first like 10 to 15 deaths was just stumbling around with my friends on comms and them stumbling around. Um, you know, we didn't have infected back then when it, the game was first put out. But man, it was definitely a struggle with the survival part because we didn't have... Uh, no hood icons of food and water. The only thing we had was if we ate enough food and water, we would get a gray, on um, a dark green, uh, energized or hydrated situation. And the brighter green it got, the more food and water we had. And if we got all the way to, I think, full water and whatever, we got an additional bar telling us that, like, we're golden. Uh, there was no health system. It was all blood-based. Uh, everything was about blood. There was nothing about uh, how many hit points that you had or what so. Uh, if you got a bleed, you took care of it right away as fast as you could. What about you, I still to this, I still to this day find myself looting IV test kit, blood test kits, IV start kits, and saline bags. I stuff those in and then people are like, yeah, you don't really need that. You just need to make sure you've eaten and drank. And I'm like, well, great. My first experience, my first death, I was killed by a lighthouse. Now, I had gone back to DayZ after the infected were added in because that's why I play DayZ is for the infected. So by the time I actually, after the backpack inception moment, started playing, a lighthouse killed me. And that's because I was at the top of the lighthouse and I go over the ladder and I feel like the game was like, haha, gotcha, bitch. Because I went up to the ladder and it's like, slide down. And I'm like, oh, dude, slide down. That's totally cool. No gloves. E down the rusty ladder on the beach. And then I'm like, gang, why is my vision all black and white? And I ended up dying from blood loss because I cut up my hands. My second time dying was because I ran out of, you know that uh, they call it the Jamaica house? I ran out of the Jamaica house real fast and there's two steps and then ground. I went flying off the porch, broke my legs and then crawled down the street until I found another Bambi. And I was like, kill me, kill me. Nope, they didn't kill me. They just went, ha, 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 took my stuff and left. I was like, dang it. Uh, so that was my second death. After that, I realized, okay, I really need to treat this more seriously. I can't just arm a two my way through this and just go for the things that I remember. So I finally started gathering the gear that I needed. I was like, oh, boony hats, you could put a fish hook in, I'm gonna fish. By the time I ran out and got some supplies, uh, I took a knife to a can of beans and spilled nine tenths of it. And I was like, <laughs> so there were there were a lot of deaths. Um, there are so many things about that game, I and I just love it. I burnt my chicken. I was like, well, at least it's cooked. Didn't realize that still gives you food poisoning. It, it was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, but I think what killed me the most because of when I came back was the helicopter zombies. Or the helicopter infected. Just having infected breakdance around you when they attacked you. They don't do it nearly as much anymore. When you're running around the street and they're orbiting you like crazy, clawing at you and you can't hit them. I didn't know if you walk backwards, you blocked. So, yeah, lots of deaths that way. It quickly became yeah. run north as fast as you can. Yeah. 
you know, the, some of the new players' experiences was I remember uh, learning from my friends that if you ate from a cereal box, this is pre-6-3, folks, that you would get a compass. There was a percentage chance to get a flat kid's compass. And the reason why I got so excited is because compasses back then were not easy to come by. And so you always wanted to find a compass because... The game had, uh, I would say, it wasn't terrible uh, visuals to learn where to go. It was more of a, it was very easy to get lost. Like, I would tell my friend, okay, the sun's to my right, it, the coast, um, the ocean's on my right, that must be, uh, that must be the east. Uh, so I'm going to go with the sun to my right, and I'm going to keep going. Well, didn't I know that Daisy is technically on a tilted axis, so when I'm running with the sun on my right. Yes, I'm running north, but I'm not the map that they give you in game because they you know the paper map. That is actually situated in a direction where you think you're running straight up on the map, but you're really not. You're like at a weird mm -hmm. angle. So I always got a little bit lost and the compass was one of the few things that I uh, wanted. So when I found out you can get it from a cereal box, oh my gosh, that was amazing. That's not in the current version of Game Daisy anymore. You find them more at like uh, like little camping uh, hunting stands inside the market stalls. Sometimes you find them in houses. But uh, I just remember the excitement of that. And I remember the other thing that I remember most about was finding a can opener was like finding gold. You were so happy to find a legit can opener. And can openers used to break down really quick. You go through like, I think like four, six or seven cans before you actually had to find a new can opener because they were that valuable. Canned food used to be really, really valuable to players. Um, and that's not really the case anymore. Yeah, that was partially because back then, like finding chickens and stuff was very difficult. Fishing, you would catch 30 wellies before you got a decent fish. Um, and... Gosh, those can openers burning out, that really made me upset. A screwdriver was my favorite can opener, hands down. <laughs> Just because the normal can openers were so sought after and so unreliable. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, let us go ahead and talk about our troubles and true joys that bring us to uh, for new players, right? We spoke about it a little bit with the can opener and the compass you know, the screwdriver in your case. But, like, what actual troubles did we encounter in DayZ? What were some of the hurdles we actually had to take care of? Uh, yeah. For me, it was the change in the socioeconomics. And what I mean by that is, there was... So the term Bambi, you know, you see it on Frankie, uh, Frankie on PC and 1080p. You see it a lot where they, they use the term Bambi. Bambies were innocent people. They were fresh spawns that were innocent, meant you no harm. You used to be able to wobble dance. That meant, come talk to me. I'm friendly. You used to talk to them. They'd be like, yeah, you would even give them a can of beans. Boy, when Daisy Standalone came out, that changed real quick. Once these guys found out they could run to a railroad track, put a rock in their hand, and knock out a player who has some pretty decent gear, the fresh spawns became vicious i actually don't even like calling them bambies anymore uh and i think that's what got me killed a lot it's just like oh there's another guy in his underwear and his t-shirt maybe he will want to party up and we can go find supplies together but he would merciless mercilessly beat me with his fist for no reason i didn't have anything i could offer him maybe some rags uh but it used to be when you first placed played if you wanted bandages you had to take off an article of clothing to create those bandages not a lot of places gave you the bandages right in the beginning. Uh, so that I think there were just a couple learning hurdles with the socioeconomics of that game. Now, could you play Devil's Advocate in the same situation? How could you spin it to sound positive? So that's actually why I play DayZ now is because of the socioeconomics. <laughs> You know, my favorite thing to do is get murdered by people. I will run up and role play with you and totally be in character. And I don't even care if I die. As long as I get that interaction, whether toxic or extremely positive, it is so funny. 
uh, like when we were doing our live play for the stream a few weeks ago. And that girl's like, do you want to be punched or do you want to be kissed? And I opted for punched and I made her kill me. I made, she was like, please stop. Please don't make me do this. I'm like, well, you've already done it now. You might as well finish the job. And she's just begging me to make her stop. And then I died. I love doing that to people. That's why I play the game now. I think what happened was before I was like, man, I'm good at shooting. I want to go to airfield and get kitted up. And I want to go around with my hero skin and I want to shoot all the bandits. Fast forward five years and I'm like, man, I really hope I get kidnapped and brutalized because that would be great right now. Obviously in game, but yes. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. nobody would want me now. I say that for you YouTube gods out there. Um, <laughs> in the game, now, in game. Yeah, in game. Um, I would have to say one of the things I struggled with in the beginning, and this is long in the past, so it's not really a gripe that's, I guess, relative today, was... If you guys thought the food and the stomach system and the disease system was complicated nowadays, you could can you imagine back then when we had very little uh, visual noises, uh, visual sounds, uh, audible noises, uh, not <laughs> visual sounds. It, it's not like a little sound wave thing popped up in my face, like a um, Batman comic book. <laughs> Snap! <laughs> oh my leg! <laughs> <laughs> no, but like we didn't have <laughs> our characters coughing at first. We didn't have that kind of stuff when diseases were first introduced, we just had to realize that our character was having issues by pushing tab and looking exactly where I talked about with water and food and energize. There were little things that would say that we were sick or there would be like some other status there, but it didn't tell you what it was. And that's why Jarl talked about the blood test kits because that's how you figured it out. Mm -hmm. But as a new player, not knowing how any of those systems worked, I think the majority of the time I died until I started to really learn how to use the medical system in the early days, obviously pre-63, was from sickness. Because I didn't know how to take care of my character right. Um, and to spin it, zero, uh, past 0.63, while many people complain about the medical system now, it is world's quality of life and overall ease difference. Like... If I caught cholera in 0.62, I would be in a hospital with uh, Tetra and vitamins waiting for me to eventually beat it. I would have to stand by a well drinking constantly. 0.63, that's no longer required to be by a well. You can still keep playing the game, take vitamins, and if you have antibiotics or vice versa, and you will eventually kick it if your food and water levels are high enough. Right. Uh, because... You know, that's kind of my woe of uh, pre-63 and my, you know, positive of past 63. Because I know a lot of people still don't like the medical system. They think it's overcomplicated or it's too hard. But really, guys, all you have to do is stay hydrated, eat quite a bit of food, and really, if you want to, just keep vitamins on yourself. Vitamins give you perfect immunity, which kills the virus faster than any medicine. If you have medicine on top of that, it's just a bonus. It's crazy. I, I have a very polarizing view that not a lot of people agree with, but I say that if you want the medical system to be easier, then you should go play Call of Duty. This game is not PvP first, survival second. It has always been survival first, PvP uh, infected last. That's their priorities. From the patches they come out with, from how they release the game, it is a survival game. I would really hate to see that stripped out just because people find it too difficult. Guess what? Into the world, you're out eating crappy food, drinking from rusty pipes. Health is going to be your number one killer. It's going to be the thing that you have to focus on the most. I mean, even in a real survival situation, you're told don't work too hard. Pace yourself. Pace, pace, pace. Take care of your health. Take care of your feet. You know, make sure that you're wearing socks. Little things that we just would be like, oh, that's so dumb, you know. But that's what survival is. And that's what I loved about it. I love the fact that you had to sit there with a thermometer, take notes, get, you know, a check people's pulse. Remember that? Is there something wrong with me? Well, mm, normal temperature. Let me check your pulse. Let me check your pulse. I'm going to check your pulse. I'm going to check this guy's pulse. And you're going around. That was how you checked in on your squad. And it was amazing. I loved it. I am glad they simplified it, but I'm glad they didn't nullify it. 
I still remember the memes of 2013, 2014, because House, I don't know if you've ever seen that show, but the character House in that show would always say, it's lupus. Well, they started changing the memes for DayZ to have House and be like, it's sepsis. Because nine out of 10 times, if you were sick, you had sepsis. <laughs> uh, definitely, definitely. Uh, I think we actually uh, just got a message. Lieutenant General Zombie said, in game, uh, but it has every cosplay outfit by coincidence. Yeah, listen. I like to dress up, okay? Don't hate on me for that. Don't hate on me. How dare <laughs> We're accepting <you. laughs> of everyone here. You can dress up as much as you want. Cosplay is cool, guys. I don't I don't care what, what you guys say. You know what's cool about cosplay for stream? I don't have to go to the con and get con cred. And then have somebody check my pulse and stick a thermometer in my mouth to see what exactly I have. So now I can avoid that. Uh well, there you guys have it, folks. Uh Yar really wants to go to Daisy Con because he already just talked about what he wants to happen. Happen. Never. That's how the infection starts. Heck no. Ah, <laughs> uh, but I know we talked slightly about how unforgiving it is, uh, and everything else. But what actually makes us think that people go from makes vanilla hard for players that they're attracted to boosted XML economies and that kind of stuff on console or heavily modded servers on PC. What makes people choose to play DayZ solely on the fact that they can play on those kind of servers versus vanilla? And let's only focus on the difficulty side of things. Is vanilla DayZ too hard for new players and we often push them to go play easier servers? I don't think it's that so much as it is that a lot of the other games that you play out there were survival elements, things like that. You want the servers with the cool cars. You want the servers with the helicopters. You want the servers with guns you could recognize, with features that you recognize from other games. I find that most people will play on heavily modded servers because it feels like other games they've played. And then gradually you start to see them, and I see this with streamers a lot, playing servers with less and less and less and less and less mods. I don't think it's the difficulty of the survival aspect as much as it is the things they enjoy about video games being absent kind of puts a mental block to where they won't enjoy the experience for what it is. So let them play, let them have their cake. But then when the cake runs out, they can come over to the kids table where we're sitting there eating toothpicks because there's nothing around and learn how that works. Uh, I think, oh. yep. Yeah, look, at, I, I think we just got something from Lieutenant Gen Zombie. Mods sometimes make the game harder than vanilla, adding in more powerful weapons and vehicles. You are 100% correct in that regard. But the question here is, is does a new player gravitate to those situations, or do they gravitate to the ones I was talking about where it's an easier experience, like you're all said, more weapons, more, more things, more flashing lights, more discos, whatever. Uh, but it really goes to is Daisy as a new player too difficult to jump into and or what is really the question here is does the streamers slash content creators on YouTube, Twitch, Kick, you name it, portray Daisy in a different light where the only way to enjoy the game is with mods um, or on the uh, XML boosted servers? I, I think we actually see this in a real world application, right? If you're on PC, you're going to see your friends playing or the streamers playing, and you're going to want to have that same experience. So you're going to gravitate towards the servers with mods. But I don't think that people are hindered by vanilla DayZ simply because of the success that the console versions have had. I mean, look at Red Falcon. That's how he got into DayZ. And they're they're not modded, you know. Uh, in fact, sometimes they're behind in patches compared to PC. So I think if given a choice, obviously you're going to go for the bells and whistles that your friends or streamers that you like enjoy. But I don't think that new players are turned by the vanilla setting in general. Sure, they probably like more mods. And if there were mods available on Xbox, I'm sure they would probably gravitate to those modded servers first. But I always call it the your server is full conundrum. You get in that daisy itch, you go to join your favorite server, it's full, you know nothing about the other servers, so then you just join a vanilla one. And you're like, you know, this ain't so bad. 
Uh, Lieutenant General Zombie hits us again with, I wouldn't say the games are very hard to jump into. It's the community that makes it harder easy. Daisy has a rep of being shot on site and stripped naked. Yes, especially on modded servers. 100%, because you can get pinged and dropped from a crazy far distance. Whereas in vanilla, where the guns are a little more bolt action, the guns are a little more forgiving, the weapons are a little more basic. Uh, I think that is where you start to see that true horror of the biggest threat is weather, survival, and uh, infected. But absolutely, if you go in and you play on a modded server, you could get hit by some guy with night vision and a rifle that can shoot up to a mile and a half. And, you know, that can be kind of a deterrent if you've been struggling to get off the beach. Yeah, that's and we... fair. Mm -hmm. no, it's, it's just, it's fair. But I also think that the majority of major people streaming Daisy or the most vi watched videos aren't those situations. And that's where I get the idea in my head. Mind you, I don't know if this is the populace, but in my head that these videos and these streamers who have these major viewer counts are the ones who help influence people on why they want to play DayZ. And when they play vanilla and realize to get what they see on these streams and these videos, they have to go to mod it. I understand why a lot of people think vanilla is too difficult because what they saw on these streamers and videos that have huge count numbers or viewer count isn't what Daisy truly is as a default game. Right. That is true. That is true. Uh, we got a couple of comments here. I want to go with 330Ts real quick because that didn't pop up. Um, the streamers I watch play on Survival Day Z server, Hardcore Survival. I do love Hardcore Survival streams. I'll watch those, and I'll definitely lean more towards that. So that's for sure. Uh, Always Streams also says, I feel like Daisy uh, to... Daisy to a new player can be difficult and boring. It's not an on-the-surface game. It's a muddled rock you wash in the river to reveal its golden undercoat. I could not say that better, even if I tried. I think what might make Vanilla Daisy a little more appealing is there is a population of people who play Daisy for the infected, for the horror elements. They want that Resident Evil feel of going through Raccoon City. I really don't think Daisy's there yet. I, I think the infected AI, and I understand it's not zombies, it's like a rage virus, which is actually really dope, but I think they could encapsulate that more. Whether it's giving them weapons to use, like mindlessly, or just having them be more of a threat. Um, God, I think one of my favorite things I ever saw was a modded server, and I've never been able to find the right mod combos, where the dark nights were much darker. The infected were faster and a little stronger. They also didn't orbit around you. And just having the guy look around with this flashlight and seeing the beady eyes of the infected down the street walking towards him and then going, <laughs> that was terrifying. I think that if if it wasn't just survival, they put a little more horror element into it. They might find people flocking to it a little more. But I could see why some people think, you know, it's kind of like a little a little empty compared to the experience. Uh, uh, no, you're, you're very horns. much right. Uh, hordes are bad. Not uh, Hordes are bad for performance, I should say. They're fun, but yeah. they're bad for performance. Um, I will say... Oh, wait. Oh, we just got a thing here. Lieutenant Gen Zombie. Some of the streams don't have organic interactions. Some of them are set up or pre-scripted. Yeah. You are totally right. However, I will be completely honest, and nowadays, it doesn't bug me anymore. Because some of the stuff actually has to be scripted to create good uh, content. You actually talked about something a little bit or earlier, Lieutenant Gen Zombie, where people literally will kill you or strip you naked and leave you on the coast. And that's kind of where some of that scripted uh, stuff is coming from, is that streamers and content creators are having more and more difficulty creating natural, true interactions because they're just constantly being one shot by people who don't care about the aspect of the game. Some could say jump to another server, but they play on populated servers for a reason. And if those servers are constantly just griefing them, I can see where the script comes from. I'm not a fan of it, but I can see the logic behind it. I can too, especially if you're trying to make content, if you're trying to make YouTube videos from your live stream and you want to have some really cool highlights yet for the last hour and a half, you've been going up and trying to have a conversation with a bunch of fresh spawns. And then they sit there with their rocks like, on day one, this happened to me a couple weeks ago. I was like, 
oh, here, you can have my plum, because I was playing a character that was really giving. And this guy goes, hey, you see that guy in the armor? Three of us Bambis had rocks in our hands, and they're like, let's get him! This guy in the armor did nothing wrong. He had a gun, he had the new medieval armor, and we beat the holy living hell out of him with rocks. Had that been a streamer who was trying to make content, I could understand why they'd be like, you know what? I need to find people that are playing. Dump, where are you? Okay, if I come meet you in that city, will you pretend to be a merchant? Oh, yeah, sure. That's really, when you're talking about those scripted or pre-planned events, most of the time, that's all it really is. They're just, they've played with each other enough that they know how to bounce that content creation back and forth. I'll be here. MD. In 0.63, they weren't really bad because the number of mods were very limited. I am coming from the fact that if I use vanilla zombies and spawn them in the area, if I spawn like 25 of them in an area, the game suffers. Performance tanks. Because the game just doesn't like that many being so close together. Um, it, now, there is also a locational issue with those too. Like if you're in a building and you're being swarmed by a horde, how many times have you killed them all, walked out of the building and saw somehow six of them were on the roof? And you're like, how did you, <laughs> how did you oh, get yeah. up there? But like the more and more numbers you get, because let's face it, 25, yes, it's a good number, but it's not really a horde, is it? When you start getting up to like 30 to 50, you will probably crash your client. Yes, before you crash the server. But who wants to play on the server where your client crashes around these hordes? There are used, there's mods on the workshop that allow you to have hordes, but they try to do it smartly. They spawn the hordes spaced out, and they only allow them to converge when uh, there's different situations happening, like you're firing at them and stuff. But wandering hordes on a vanilla DayZ server? Kind of bad. Yes, and we've got Ryan here. I'm sorry if I say this wrong. I believe that's Zeissen, New Zealand. Maybe I'm doing that wrong. Zeissen in Z for now. Uh, it says, I think scripted content and streams encourages players to RP when they first start. So it doesn't bother me as I think it's overall good for the game. Yeah, and you know what? I kind of get both sides of the fence. My I always role play when I play DayZ, but I join non-role play servers. Because sometimes that's scripted where everybody's role playing. Sometimes it gets a little too much. I love going to somebody who doesn't even expect it and being like, hey, yo, I'm Joey. All right, we're going to start a family here, a little gang. All right, so what's your name? My name's Frank. I don't like Frank. We're going to call you Frankie, okay? And then just gathering people who aren't expecting it. They're just trying not to get shot by people and you rope them into something crazy. I don't like going to people that are working with it, you know? All right, guys. Now, I love this topic and everything else, but let's just go ahead. Now, we've talked about some of the trolls we've had in DayZ. We've talked about how DayZ is unforgiving to players, but let's go ahead and just really uh, talk about how we think we can improve it. How do we think we can make DayZ better? And, you know, these are just some uh, Spitfire questions, but think about them for a second, Yarl. What can Daisy do be uh, do better for new players? What can Daisy do uh, less for new players? What can players do to help other players, community-wise or videos or content-wise? This includes streamers and uh, content creators. Is Bambi killing a real issue? Do Bambis really suffer a problem from being poached or attacked? And then, why does Daisy have no tutorial? Now. I'm going to let that fester for a second, Yarl, while I talk about what I think Daisy you can do to improve. However, what I think Daisy could do to help new players is kind of what they have kind of started to do. Those new hip, uh, helpful hints in this last patch, Daisy 1.20, where in the loading screen you had some more hints. I would like to see more of those. But you know what I would like to see more of these things? I would love to see more of these situations inside the escape menu, or I would like to see possibly a small dongle or button inside of the player inventory. Now this can be in the bottom left hand of the screen or the bottom right, top left or whatever, somewhere where it's obscure. But when you have those loading screen tips, it can be all like, hey, new to DayZ, don't forget to click the question mark in the lower left hand corner of your inventory screen for more helpful hints. And what that does is it brings up hints that you can scroll through by pushing a button, and it shows you all of the previous hints that you would see in the loading screen. This would give players not only a way to see 
things that could be done, but also give players a way to see, hey, I saw something about how to open canned food. You can do it with more than a can opener. Uh, and they could go back and feel like, oh, yes, I was totally right. Dude, try the sledgehammer. And then they'll find out, guess what? The sledgehammer spills a lot of fucking beans. But it is key for them to give hints. I am totally for hints. I honestly think uh, spawning with bandages, I'd rather go back to rags. I'd rather give, uh, take away the t-shirt, give them back a hoodie, which has medium insulation instead of low insulation. And I would rather sacrifice the bandages for rags and take the t-shirt and give them a hoodie back. That's my suggestions for improving the new player experience on Daisy. My suggestions twofold. I want immersive tutorials. I want there to be medical guides in the hospitals. I want there to be survival guides in police stations and camping sites. I think that would be something that you could look at, like a little, like in Forest, the Forest and the Sons of the Forest. They have that one survival guide. Have it built in game. Or if you die while you're at your death screen, have an explanation. You died of this illness and have a scroll down that they can read of common illnesses, how to treat them. Let them read while they're dead so that when they respawn, they have that better education and they can move on from that. Um, I think having a help menu in the game is awesome, but I think you're going to get people like, I was looking at the help menu and I got shot. So incorporate it into the game in a mechanics wise. Is Bambi killing a real issue? Not as much as it used to be. Bambi on Bambi violence is the big problem now. Uh, to be fair, DZ Survival is fairly basic compared to, say, a game like Scum, where you need to balance your fat calories and then you have intestines and stomach. Daisy doesn't really need a tutorial. That's fair, but uh, a lot of people don't realize that you don't have to look for stones at railroad tracks. That if you have a hammer, you can go to a big rock and make all the stones you want. And there you go. You have your stone axes and your stone knives. People just don't know that unless they either do it by accident or somebody tells them. Um, once you learn that, you're like, oh, by having that ability where it's like, just having a small guide, a oh, survival guide. Don't have a knife? Try stone tools. I know a lot of people say that Daisy uses a lot of common sense, but folks, you hit on something there, Lieutenant Gen uh, Zombie, with your last comment that we just read, that games don't always have common sense into them. I don't know how many games I've played out there that are survival where it doesn't make common sense. Like, I was recently playing Rust, and the only way to get stones is to attack a large boulder. I can't hit a stone face. I can't smash the small rocks on the ground or pick them up. So I understand a lot of people are like, oh, you know, games are, you know, easier, complex. But when you compare two games for Scum and DayZ, I would say while Scum, yes, has a more intricate system, it has a more convoluted system that you learn over time how to be better at. What we're talking about is what you learn as a fresh player. Now, Scum definitely has that problem, and it is tough. But I don't know if I would compare the two systems side by side that way. So, because Scum's systems are on purpose truly convoluted, where Daisy's systems are, you just don't know how the mechanics work yet, but you'll get there kind of situation. And that's kind of more where, where I want to point people to, is that. Like you're all said, finding stones on railroad tracks, or knowing what that more tools than just a sledge, um, than just a can opener can open cans and all that kind of stuff. Yes, it's experimentation, but most people don't stop and think about that when they're playing video games anymore, because most video games don't make common sense a lot of the times. Right, right. Absolutely so, excellent. <clears throat> You know, and th this part is for us to be giving possible solutions slash improvements to DayZ. Now, whether or not these solutions or improvements are actually possible, like you all even pointed out, that my uh, question mark or in-game guide could be problematic because people die or whatever and they get mad and blame the game, that is definitely a fair criticism of that. But the reality of fact is, is us as players, streamers, people who talk about the game, we can suggest possible ideas and Daisy can take it and be all like, you know what? I actually agree with Yarl. That's a that's actually a possible problem. And somebody's all like, well, what if we do this and this and this and this? And they're all like, hey, that's cool. Um, but remember, folks, the game doesn't have to be incredibly easy because we add in an easier experience. We just want to make sure that player retention stays up high and we keep bringing in new players.
So, folks, uh, we recently decided to do a poll on our Twitter about what people experienced in DayZ when they first started playing. Now, I'll tell you what I wrote for the poll. What was your first experience in DayZ like? Leave your comments below or vote in the poll, but we're wondering. And the poll poll's winner was Embrace the Challenge, is what most people said they did. Now, coming up in actually neck and neck, they weren't even neck and neck, they were even, was that they found the game challenging and frustrating. And only 8% of the polies found, um, had a friend to help them out. This was out of 87 votes. So if you voted in our poll, thank you. That was our highest voted poll yet, and it was awesome. But we also got a lot of cool comments. Like, we got a comment from Jarl, who cares about him. Uh, then we had Lord, Lord Facepalm. Uh, he said it was pretty rough, but I was determined to learn from all the mistakes us noobs make. Favorite game now. And then we had plenty of others. Like we had, uh, you know, Mr. a uh, little Mr. E. I bought the Daisy game on console and it was unable to load the game for like a solid year back in 2018, I think. And then I reloaded, uh, downloaded the Daisy and got on and was so happy. And then some guys who were cannibals and, and were friendly with me and made me kill a guy with a pistol. Now, the, we have a couple of more contents and everything else. One of the funnier comments that we got was not necessarily a comment, it was a video. And it was the famous Scale Speeder. If you guys don't know who he is, his name is Scale Speeder. Uh, you can look him up on YouTube. He hated the game. He played it first time on Xbox when it was a demo, and he could not stand it. He literally starved, uh, uh, died of thirst, because he wasn't paying attention and didn't see that the right trigger made him drink water. <laughs> <laughs> But overall, this poll is just a small segment of the entire Daisy community. And while I would love to see the entire Daisy vote on this, not only for, you know, because it's awesome, but also to really see whether or not these numbers are remain the same, whether or not the outcome is truly that. Because a lot of the people who follow us are more hardcore and more vanilla lovers who like a challenge. I would love to see one day maybe get a huge audience of just people who are brand new to our poll and see what happens. But overall, folks, I think this was a lot of fun. Oh, I think Dave said something. On, on that note, Dave, do you find that finding a source of food is difficult for you? Oh. Yeah, I guess if people always underestimate the infected, it's pretty easy to get an all-you-can-eat buffet, huh? Pipsy. I didn't take you as a Pipsy man. I thought you were a Nota Cola guy. All right. You know what? I'm in dump. Every time I communicate with him, he gets snippy with me. <laughs> yeah, you too, buddy. I'm going to let you handle this dump. Come on, Dave. Be fair. What have you seen players struggle with? You're an infected. Food's everywhere for you. Wow. Dave, is that how you really feel? Are you, are you telling me that you think players are just sissies and they need to suck it up and deal with it? Oh. Wow. I just want to go on the record here, folks. Dave does not speak for the community. <laughs> Dave, Dave speaks for me. I agree with Dave in this one. <laughs> yeah, high five, well, Dave. Dave. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Now, what's really interesting, too, and I have a pen in my hand, I don't know why, but, um, is server owners. Server owners, if you are in chat, or if you want to make a comment down below, let us know what you guys think would be better in Day Z. Players, feel free to do so, too. You know what, everybody, feel free to let us know what you think could be better to help keep players on your servers longer from the vanilla experience itself. What can we do? What can we suggest? What can we improve upon Daisy to make Daisy a better game for people who just bought it and are just starting? Whether it's making tutorials, videos, in-game guides, the devs doing something unique and new like their helpful guides from 1.21, or just overall being more welcoming as a community. What do you guys think we can do overall? So, now that I've said that, 
and ran out of breath while saying it, I would like to talk about our closing remarks. So we talked about our experience with why we bought Daisy, or what made us bought Daisy, or in y'all's experience, what made you go from the Daisy mod to Daisy standalone, back to Daisy mod, back to Daisy standalone. But it's really interesting that we had all of these fun and different experiences. I came into Daisy when it first hit standalone, never played the mod. Jarl was a mod player and played Arma 2 before the mod ever came out. Red is late to the business, but absolutely loves the game. Was once a console player for a short amount of time, too. All these things are a unique perspective on how we are introduced to Daisy, and actually what pushed us to buy it was actually different as well. Jarl was more about the hype, I was more about playing with my friends and everything else. Red missed the bus, and he came in very late, but he still enjoyed the show over uh, the Daisy overall and was very happy about it. So, think about that, folks. We have so many different opinions, so many different ways of seeing Daisy, that we also had different experiences on our first 10 to 15 deaths, our first survivals, our first things. And we have various opinions about how to actually make the game more welcoming to new players. Dave thinks everybody is a sissy and needs to suck it up and deal with everything. We also we all have different opinions, and you know what? You can't fault Dave because I'm pretty sure he gets quite a few uh, chomps in every now and then, so he's probably happy. But folks, next week's episode is going to be on survival games coming in 2023. Yeah, we're actually deviating from the schedule. It's not Project Zomboid. It's about survival games coming in 2023, and we're super excited about that. Yarl is going to actually be leading that episode, and I am so happy. Yarl, what can we expect? Well, I definitely want to take a deep dive into Pacific Drive, as well as a lot of the survival titles that are coming out that have been announced over the different expos that they had for PlayStation, Xbox, and PC including a very odd Baba Yaga's Hut type survival game that although may not tickle my fancy, still looks very interesting. So we're going to cover it all, talk about what our thoughts are on each game, and even go over some of the details that we may have missed. Well, folks, I hope you all have a wonderful time watching us. It was a pleasure having you, so many of you, chat and talk in our well, live chat and in our comments. I hope you all have a wonderful night and to talk for now. Bye. Well, folks, thank you very much for watching our video and this podcast episode. Please like and subscribe, and it definitely helps us when you do. Please remember that you can also comment down below, and who knows, maybe we'll read or talk about your comment in our next episodes. Folks, I also want you to make sure to thank our staff members, being Yarla Goats and Red Falcon. Yarla Goats streams on Twitch quite regularly, and Red Falcon is responsible for the Red Falcon Hel Heli mods on the Daisy Workshop on PC. We are happy to have you folks here, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.